Welcome everybody. And look, the title of the presentation is Why Not a Title Barrier for Cork? Question mark cost. Because it's the question that keeps coming up and cost appears to be the primary reason given by those arguing against the title barrier. Uh, there, there's a huge gap between the OPW's cost estimates past and present and a vast chasm between the current OPW position on cost and the estimates provided by some very reputable third parties. So on that basis, an interrogation of what everyone is saying is critical to a full understanding. We'll start by looking at the genesis and the evolution of the OPW's own assessments of tidal barriers for Cork and the associated costs that they've presented to the public. Um, this process started in 2014 with the publication of the Lee CFRAMS, that's the Catchment Flood Risk Assessment and Management Study, um, and it's a requirement by the EU Directive on Floods, uh, or the Flood Directive. Uh, the Lower Lee Flood Relief Scheme then kicked off as a project in its own right and presented an options report for public consultation. And whether it was a surprise or not, the, the public did get involved and very energised on the proposals and the issue of a tidal barrier did um, come to the fore. Uh, following different presentations of options by stakeholder groups uh, and some uh, very reputable academics uh, with experience in the area and uh, knowledge of Cork City and flooding in Cork City. So the o OPW responded to this public engagement with a supplementary report on the subject of a tidal barrier. Now to look at what the OPW Lee CFRAM study presented in the first instance, it references three tidal barriers one at the Jack Lynch Tunnel, which uh, they didn't provide an image for. Uh, another at Roaches Point, which is on the left of your screen there, which is about a kilometre of open deep water at the mouth of the harbour. And another option, which um, I suppose logically looking in 2D, you'd look at the uh, narrowest points of the harbour that you could um, maybe cut off incoming uh, flood tides with a, a company by a storm surge and that would be between um, Passage West, Monkstown and Great Island but the logic being that Great Island is an island and water can get around it at the other side so you'd need a second gate at Marlogue on the other side of Great Island so on the right of your scheme you see what is commonly referred to as the Great Island tidal barrier or the two gate solution presented by the OPW. Now that leads us on to the, Lee C or the Lower Lee Flood Relief Scheme. And the options report really was just light touch in terms of uh, the assessment of tidal barriers. Um, it dismissed the uh, Roaches Point uh, tidal barrier as being too costly and too much of an undertaking, which is a fair enough uh, initial response. Um, it also dismissed the, um, the, the Tivoli or uh, Black Rock or uh, Jack Lynch Tunnel uh, barrier on the basis of the storage behind, uh, based on a design envelope that would include um, a 1 in 100 year flow on the river and what was assessed as coming, potentially coming from the dams. We'll talk about fluvial flooding later. There's a small bit of an overlap here. Um, now, there were some unspecific references in this uh, brief assessment presented in the options report, running to one and a half pages. There were some brief um, and unspecific references to, uh, to a high-level report, which nobody has seen or nobody in the public, it hasn't been presented to the public. There's also some incorrect statements mentioned here. Um, misrepresenting uh, some figures in the previous uh, Lee Seafram's report. And we'll get to a bit of that later as well. So um, that's, the, that's the sum total of the title barrier presented. So a stakeholder group called Safe Cork City um, 
was quickly established and quickly came to the fore uh, and presented a separate option. Um, you could say that the basis of their pre presentation of a tidal barrier option previously unconsidered at Little Island, which would run from just north of uh, Passage West uh, across to the Carrigrenin um, treatment plant peninsula, you may call it, on uh, Little Island. Now, again, looking on 2D, that's a, a, a wider stretch of water. It's a kilometre wide, but again, uh, what mightn't have been considered was the depth of water. And if you look at the right, the bathymetry uh, of Cork Harbour would show that Loch Mahan is significantly shallower than either of the two channels uh, proposed for the Great Island barrier. Now, there is a channel here that is dredged, in fact, to allow navigation through Loch Mahan. Uh, that channel is 70 metres wide uh, dredged, so Again, that leads on to what was proposed as the gate width for this option. So the result is four barrier alternatives, and these are costed across three different OPW reports. And what you can see here is that the Lee C. Frams re report mentioned that a tidal barrier activity, uh, the Jack Lynch Tunnel, is approximately 100 million euros. Now they they don't go into great detail on that costing. They do go into significant detail on their cost estimates and their um, basis for the cost estimates on the tidal barriers at both Passage and Marlogue, which is the Great Island two-gate solution. They mentioned that this would cost 197 million to build and a whole life cost or uh, construction delivery cost plus operating cost over the lifetime of the project of 340 million. They also cost at the, the Roaches Point one at the 1.6 or 1.7 billion, which again makes it uh, probably um, off the agenda really in terms of the public finances and any cost benefit analysis. So look, um, there was a mistake that I referenced earlier in the one and a half pages of the lower leaf flood relief scheme options report. And you'll see across there that they referenced that the Great Island solution or the two gate solution would cost around about 900 million. Now, how did they arrive at that? It's uh, very vague, but they say that the Lee Seafram's report said that the Great Island two gate tidal barrier would cost 340 million to build and that they have produced a high level report which suggests that it'd be higher than that and that the overall project cost would be around 900 million. Now, that's not what the Lee Frams report said. It didn't say it would cost 340 million to build. It said it would cost 197 million to build. That's the mistake I was referring to earlier. And that high level report that they reference uh, hasn't been seen. So, um, and hasn't been, hasn't been published and there has been some requests for that and still hasn't come to any public attention. So after that one and a half pages and after the stakeholder group uh, costed their own barrier and presented their own barrier at Little Island, it was a new option that gained a lot of public uh, our traction with the public. So the OPW then produced a 400 page plus assessment of the tidal barrier at Little Island and they included an assessment and further cost assessment of the tidal barrier at Great Island. Um, now there's two costs in there, both uh, CapEx or delivery cost of the project for the Little Island tidal barrier and to uh, whole life costs. Again, um, the, the line is that it will cost a billion euros, project cost, whole life cost, whatever you want to call it. Uh, now, consequently, they've had to inflate the, what would logically be a more expensive tidal barrier at uh, Great Island because of the, the two gates and that has risen to a whole life cost of 1.73 billion. That's a 
fairly significant rise. So um, look, how did we get here? And no presentation is complete without a Dilbert. And I, I think, look, uh, one of life's great mysteries uh, is how they got that inflation or that level of degree of inflation between 2014 and 2017. But hopefully this uh, presentation will go some way to explaining the methodology used and what we know from the various estimates. Uh, now, again, to repeat that question, um, how, how did 197 million to build two gates either side of Great Island increase by 700% to 1.4 billion? Or uh, you could say the, the whole life cost, if you look at the 340 million down here from the least key frames, uh, the graph spectacularly shows the inflation amongst the three, um, the three OPW reports to 1.73 billion. That's a 500% increase on the whole life cost. So um, from the options report, we referenced the mistake that was made in um, referencing the 300. 340 million as a capex rather than a totex cost. Um, and we mentioned uh, the omission of the high level report. Now, we saw from the last table that there were two cost estimates produced by the OPW for the Little Island Tidal Barrier. Uh, this table shows the breakdown of these estimates and what they include. Uh, there's a bit of a gap between the two estimates and a few ancillary inclusions that are worthy of interrogation. You'll see here that there's uh, additional tidal gates at motorway bridges on the N25. Uh, there's upstream fluvial defences included. And there's a significant gap on what would be a redesign uh, on the sluice gates alone and the quantity of sluice gates included by the OPW. So this is the OPW predicted, uh, or sorry, we'll, we'll start with the issue of the tidal gates at the, at the N25 bypass. Now, to Cork people, that would be more commonly known as the Carrick Tool Bypass. And we're specifically speaking about where the road leaves Little Island. And uh, you've got the lagoon at Longton on one side and maybe the looking out to Foto Island and Great Island on the other side. It's also where the, the rail line to Cove passes underneath the motorway. Now, uh, what you'll see here is um, the basis for the bypass around Little Island, which again, Cork people would be familiar, is an island in all but name. Um, or sorry, sorry, is only an island in, in name. Uh, note that the water level in this uh, presentation by the OPW is at 4.38 metres. This is one and a half metres higher than the one in 200 year flood level. Um, it would be probably what you would build the crest of the tidal barrier to in order to um, allow a bit of freeboard between the top of the tidal barrier and an increase in sea level of a metre plus a storm surge for one in 200 year flood of a further meter. So uh, like for com comparisons with a wall scheme, this is um, a, a lot higher and a meter higher than what they're proposing to build the walls to in the city center. Uh, you can see that the, the bypass is fairly tenuous and only occurs at a very small location at Dunkettle prior to Dunkettle coming from the east. This is the OPW predicted flood map for the one in 200 year storm, which gives a greater kind of um, clarity or it's there's a certainly a finer resolution on the flooding uh, around Little Island. Uh, it's, it's clear that a any level conveyance of water below the N25 is required for such a bypass. So thanks to the clearing works for the Dunkettle upgrade works, which have been happening in the last year, it's clear that the water is conveyed around Little Island through a network of uh, short pipes through dikes, uh, which separate a number of lagoons. 
The final lagoon is fed by one 900 millimeter diameter pipe, which could be closed easily by means of a 2000 euro valve, negating the need for a 26 million euro spend at the bridges for tidal gates. Um, it would seem the more logical and cost effective. So look, um, the, the question would be, do you even have to spend 2000 euros on a valve at that location when it's such a such a small orifice connection uh, between the lagoon either side of the N25 at Dunkettle. And I would think that you don't require the valve based on the tiny amount of water that could be forced through at high tide. Certainly not enough to flood the city. I'd point at two examples just to demonstrate this principle. And um, you've got the ongoing uh, project to defend Venice with a series of 78 tidal gates um, all approximately 60 to 70 meters uh, wide and um, the principle there is that if any one of the gates didn't work it wouldn't make a difference because the volume of water can't go through and we don't have to look to Venice or we don't have to look to Italy to demonstrate this principle. Lochine in uh, West Cork uh, would be very familiar to Cork people and the unusual aspect of it is that it has a, only a one metre tidal range in this marine lake due to the, the small opening at the, at the mouth of the lake to the, to, to the Atlantic Ocean. So if we accept that those two gates aren't needed at, um, at the N25, the second big difference in the cost and the major cost element of a tidal barrier in any event is um, is the tidal, the navigable tidal gate. So why are the OPW saying we need a second navigable, navigable gate in our barrier? International experience across three continents over a number of decades would say you don't. Uh, on your screen there is the Maceland barrier, which protects much of Rotterdam port, uh, which is the second busiest port in the world. And there is no alternative second gate route around this barrier for the vast majority of the traffic that travels through this. There is a system of canals where if you're in a, a leisure boat you, over a period of a, two days, you, 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 you may end up at the other side of the barrier, but not for the traffic that goes through here to the port. And you would say if it, if one gate is good enough for Rotterdam port, is it good enough for Cork City? Here is a, another gate in New Bedford in the US built in the 70s. It's never got stuck on closed uh, or obstructed navigation. And um, these gates are normally open. So logic would suggest that the failure mode of any gates would be on the open position and not on the closed and they never would be a barrier to navigation. So look, I can't see any logical argument for a second gate. Um, you know, the it, it's so costly to provide such unprecedented redundancy. You really have to drill in or have a very good reason for navigation to uh, justify a second gate. Now, uh, that that argument on navigation is blown out of the water somewhat by the plans to move the port of Cork from Tivoli and the activities that are left on the city keys to the new facility under construction at Ringeskiddy. The OPW supplementary report briefly mentions that the Port of Cork activities may be re relocating from Tivoli to Ringeskiddy, but that the timeline is unknown or uncertain. Now, I find this sort of uh, loose reference uh, quite disingenuous. Um, I've included a list of planning permissions, and when they were granted um, for the development at Ringeskiddy, um, they were all in advance of publication, some two and a half to three years in advance of the publication of the of the supplementary report. Um, agents for the OPW would have been well aware of these plans and would have referenced these plans in um, 
in some of their work for that they undertook for separate clients on issues like the the incinerator in uh, Ring of Skiddy. Uh, the new port was under construction at the time of the supplementary report uh, publication. And look, the, there's the list of the planning permissions um, and oral hearings that were ongoing when the supplementary report came out. The justification for the second navigable gate is weak at best and potentially based on a completely false premise. Um, this is a brief slide to show why the port is relocating uh, from, um, from, Ring, from Tivoli to Ring of Skiddy. Um, now, all of this begs the question as to what the current and future navigation requirement through Loch Mahan is. The answer as to the type, frequency and acceptable dwell time for any of the maritime traffic that goes through Loch Mahan uh, has huge implications for the design of the barrier. Um, I've a bit of text there asking or posing certain questions. Will it be leisure vessels only? You know, is, is in fact the 60 meter wide gate excessive uh, could cost be reduced further. Um, look, even with the prior to the port relocating, um, you know, a, a walk along the marina or time spent observing would tell you that there's only one to two ships a day, um, you know, passing through Loch Man. And look, then there's the issue of what's the acceptable dwell time. You know, if can these ships wait at some of the various facilities in Cove, Passage, Ring of Skiddy, Belvelli, Rhone Dockyard, Hall Bolan, uh, many of the marinas, if disruption to um, navigation was uh, encountered for any reason, whether it was a short term um, uh, closure of the tidal gate our short-term um, uh, high velocities. Uh, we'll come to that later discussing the sluice gates. It should, should also be noted that the discussion on the future use of the city and Tivoli Docklands are well advanced. Uh, in conjunction with the port relocation, the future navigation requirements can be considered minimal in comparison to the current low levels that are there at the moment. Um, on your screen are some of the various plans put forward by both the City Council to have up to 10,000 uh, people uh, living, or sorry, 10,000 properties uh, located in the City Docklands and um, the Port of Cork's own proposals for a 4,000 strong uh, property development on the Tivoli Docks, which shows a a network, a nice network of canals and everything um, permeating Tivoli. Um, so they want to keep that water connection rather than building more walls uh, in those future developments. And there's also some of the consultation documents and publications on the various areas by the City Council. And just briefly, uh, here are some of the new bridges uh, envisioned in the Cork Docklands uh, plan and harping back to the notion that a normally, a normally open navigation gate in the tidal barrier could get stuck on closed and requires a second gate. I would posit that it would be more likely for one of the two lifting bridges proposed to get stuck in the default closed position. And I don't see anyone uh, planning a second river channel to bypass these with a second lifting gate uh, in, uh, in parallel to these bridges. It, it just wouldn't be logical. So um, I hope I've done enough to demonstrate that uh, one gate for navigation purposes is plenty and that the second is completely superfluous. Now, the next question then would be, uh, are fluvial defences west of the city centre to be included in the tidal barrier costs? Uh, there are three good reasons why not, which we will go into in more detail maybe in another presentation. 
but just to mention that the High Court and Supreme Court rulings on the 2009 flood in the city would effectively mean that there is no precipitating river flood event on the Lee as we know it, that is since the dams were built in the 1950s, that would justify fluvial flood defences. So defences would be unprecedented in such circumstances or a project to construct defences would be unprecedented in such circumstances. So for that reason alone and the other two reasons on your screen, we're excluding them from this analysis. So um, that brings us to uh, crossing out some of what we feel may be superfluous uh, ancillary costs that were included and a recalculation of the contingency and the total cost based on that for the two options. And what you can see is that the cost estimate for those two options begins to tumble. So we're gonna talk about sluice gates next, which are two major costs and with a difference of 200 million between the two options, uh, not insignificant. So um, they're located in the red box on the table. So the question comes to what length of sluice gates is required basically and how much will these cost? And the cost is a function of the quantity and the rate. So we're going to look into both those issues. What are sluice gates? Essentially, sluice gates are any arrangement of opening where water and tide can permeate the barrier and be closed when required. Generally, short spans as no navigation is required through these gates and the depth of the gates uh, only need to be between high tide and low tide and they're just conveying uh, water and any, uh, any uh, marine life uh, in that zone. The photo on the left is a good example of what these gates would look like and what are, were proposed and costed by the uh, Safe Cork City Group and by their consultants, HR Wallingford's um, 15 meter span uh, gate complexes uh, arranged together to give you 30 meters of gates. Um, the Sluice gates are very common. So there's a photo of Partine Weir on the River Shannon there to give you an idea. Um, sluice gates would be the same as when you see water cascading over the top of a dam. That's what's happening with the reservoir. Uh, the dam operator is opening sluice gates uh, to let more water through and let it down the face of a dam. Um, so uh, essentially, the OPW presented the two little island tidal barrier scenario, tidal barrier scenarios from their model in the supplementary report. The maximum velocities over a 15 day tidal cycle for both the flood, our incoming tide, and the ebb tide are presented. Uh, they did this for both the 90 metres of sluice gates proposed by the stakeholder group Safe Cork City and for their redesign uh, with the second navigable gate and the 300 metres of sluice gates. The results are, broadly speaking, a max velocity through the Safe Cork City 90 metres of sluice gates of 3 metres per second and a maximum velocity through the OPW's redesign with the 300 meters of sluice gates of 0.8 to 1.2 meters per second. Remember now that these are maximum velocities encountered over a 15 day cycle uh, of tides. And the premise here is that for navigation that two meters per second is the safe navigation uh, water speed. So, Again, water velocity is very much proportional to the length of openings or the length of, um, of uh, sluice gates, taking that the depth of the sluice gates is constant, which is the, from again, from uh, high tide to low tide, tide range. And um, the, 
the max water uh, speed for navigation is two meters per second. So it may be safe to say that the Save Cork City approach can be considered as insufficient and the OPW approach can be considered as excessive. So happily, the maths are easy to allow um, a simple interpolation of what length of the sluice gate openings in the barrier would allow for safe nav navigation all of the time. And that would work out at with one sixty meter gate at two hundred and twenty five meters of sluice gates, and that will give you your max velocity of two meters per second. Um, you you're quite entitled to say what's wrong with a max velocity of three meters per sec per second, because isn't it temporary? And you'd be right. Um, this brings us back to our navigation requirements. Do we need to have uh, open navigation all of the time. Uh, there's a picture here of boats dwelling at Passage West uh, when the Keys were busy once upon a time in Cork City and uh, ships had to weigh anchor and or drop anchor, sorry, and um, wait their turn. Um, so can this happen for the envisaged traffic or leisure traffic that uh, may be passing through Lockman in the future. So the real question should be what percentage of tides and for how long would navigation be impacted by higher water velocities? So here I've taken the maximum uh, water velocity snapshots uh, for the 90 meter barrier that were presented by the OPW. Um, and I've mapped these to the profile of the nearest location where tidal current speeds were recorded in Cork Harbour and are available through the Admiralty charts. The results are interesting. Uh, on neap tides, the velocity would never exceed one and a half metres per second, which is always safe navigation, uh, well below the two metres per second. And for spring tides, navigation might be disrupted for approximately four hours on that specific day. Uh, and obviously a sliding scale of disruption from four hours down to nothing in the days either side of the one in 15 day spring tide. So um, it's a crude assessment uh, in the absence of having access to the OPW model or the, in um, the absence of the OPW presenting anything but other than their maximum velocities. Uh, so we're going to be uber conservative in this analysis uh, on cost, and we're going to allow for 225 meters of sluice gates and safe navigation through Lockman all of the time and through the tidal gate all of the time, uh, despite the port relocation and plans to change the use of the city keys. So the question then turns to the cost, how much do sluice gates cost? Well, there are three costing reports that have attempted to do this. Uh, one by H.R. Wallingford uh, on behalf of Save Cork City, published in, as, in October 2017 and in uh, response to the public consultation period. Then there was the extensive uh, supplementary report on tidal barrier. Um, Tidal barriers presented by the OPW, uh, which is, is is the methodology that we're discussing at the moment, and um, they used a lot of uh, academic research in developing their uh, their their costs and their unit costs for tidal gates, and. Uh, a lot of that research was done by a professor in TU Delft in the Netherlands. So again, um, recognizing that there was maybe a few shortfalls in the OPW assessment, um, TU Delft were commissioned to analyze the OPW's uh, costings and, and use of their research and uh, produce a, a, a cost report for the tidal barrier at Little Island. So comparing apples with apples, uh, the only common uh, pricing, uh, common option 
to the three reports is the 16 meter gate plus the 90 meter sluice gate uh, configuration of the tidal barrier. And you can see that um, the OPW's estimate of just shy of 350 million euros is uh, significantly higher than the the much closer uh, HR Wallingford and TU Delta estimates, 140 million and 186 million respectively. Um, the fact that these are closely in agreement uh, would uh, definitely warrant um, warrant recognition. There's another way um, that you could uh, look at the cost of the sluice gates. Uh, I mentioned that sluice gates are very common and they are. So we have experience. We have experience in Cork. We have experience in Ireland of constructing sluice gates. Uh, the sluice gates of 15 meter span uh, structure would be significantly smaller and not include as much uh, ancillary works, the piers and everything that um, was undertaken for a tidal gate at the harbour of Cape Clear. Incidentally, that gate was constructed in dry dock in Verone Dockyards in, um, on Great Island and towed all the way to Cape Clear Island. So you can imagine the project costs are significant for this and that towing something from that dockyard to Little Island into place would be uh, significantly lower and that you would also have economies of scale if you are doing 90 metres of these or more or the 225 metre length of sluice gates. So look, there's analogous estimation of sluice gate costs that we can employ here. And if nothing else, these provide a very valuable sense check on our cost estimates. So the, these are the, the five methodologies, the three reports and the two analogous um, uh, examples that we're using. The other was in uh, the Lag and Weir in Belfast, um, which uh, is a tidal gate for all intents and purposes. Uh, it operates differently to hold water into the Lagan uh, at low tide, but uh, same principle. Uh, so how would you drill down these to find a uh, unit rate cost and apply it to the 225 meters of sluice gates? So uh, again, we've done that far. It's very easy to do with the reports. An interesting thing here is happening with the OPW report. The OPW have two different rates for their first navigable gate, 60 meters wide of 171 thousand euros per meter squared and their second gate uh or sorry 182 uh, thousand euros per meter squared and logically their second gate is always going to be a bit cheaper if you were building two of them so they've reduced that down to 166 thousand euros per meter squared for the second uh, expensive gate i'll call it that allows uh, ships to um to uh pass through but that doesn't explain how their unit rate cost for the sluice gates is somehow higher than the unit rate cost they use for the second navigable gate. But look, either way, um, if you apply the OPW approach, it ends up at 230 million, uh, which is uh, wildly in excess of any of the other estimates. Here are the estimates uh, plotted what they look like. Um, you can see that our sense checks of the analogous um, cost estimates uh, are a good indication of um, the, the acceptability of the HR Wallingford and the TU, Elf, TU Delft cost estimates and that the OPW cost estimate is, a, is an outlier. Um, there's no other way and it really would drag up an estimate uh, based on averages, but that's what we're going to do here. We're going to be uh, very cautious and very conservative and we're going to um, give standing and merit to the OPW um, 
uh, assessment and estimation. So um, we end up with an average cost of 87 million. So if you correct our graph, our, our table of the three separate options and, and back, back to this corrected cost table, we're introducing a third column, uh, which shows the 225 meter sluice gate design. There are broadly three churches uh, here. There's the Save Cork City 90 meter um, option, which you could be termed an a la carte approach that doesn't mind if the occasional four hours of uh, red light at the gate for navigation is uh, in play. There's the fanatical or extreme um, approach to sluice gates adopted by the OPW. And then there's the middle ground believer, you know, of the 225 meter option, which will give you your safe navigation speeds all of the time. And, you know, uh, subscribing to this uh, belief system should be enough to get you to heaven. Now, there are millions of euros and tens of millions of euros in the difference between the options. So um, that's certainly enough to test anyone's belief in any creed. And it's worth remembering that uh, there are any amount of creeds in between these options. Um, the 225 meters of sluices isn't hard and fast. You could say you're, you're uh, leaning to somewhere between that and the Save Cork City option, or you know, for conservatism, you might uh, adopt an approach that maybe 250 would uh, suit, suit your, uh, your comfort levels better. So, how reasonable that brings us to the, the the big ticket cost item which is the navigable gate and how reasonable is the 159 million attributed to this um now the the average would be closer to the opw's assessment in this regard and closer to the delft um because hr wallingford in their approach have stripped out all the other project costs uh, such as embankments and contingencies and client costs and added these in separately. The TU Delft approach has uh, taken a unit rate of the outturn cost of projects and applied it to the gate based on the dimensions of the gate. Uh, the OPW have taken an approach which is a bit of a hybrid approach. They've taken the output costs of some of the biggest tidal barrier projects in the world. They've used this to develop a unit rate for the tidal gate, applied it on the dimensions of the tidal gate, and then added back in all the ancillary costs, of what TU Delft called nourishments. There's always going to be some element of embankments, sluices, you know, with every tidal gate project. And they've added these in, they've added in the client costs again. So again, the OPW cost estimate and approach and methodology is open to a lot of criticism. Uh, the other two are, um, I suppose, more strict in their approach and more logical um you can either adopt one or the other but that that explains the difference between the tu delft cost and the hr wallingford cost now uh again we're taking the three estimates and we're applying an average uh there are more scientific approaches but again this would seem a reasonable conservative approach giving weight to the opw's assessment and that will give us a rough order magnitude of 113 million for the navigable gate. Now, um, if people were looking for a point of reference, you could say that the Jack Lynch tunnel was constructed for 70 million pounds once upon a time and corrected for today's money and Euro, we're talking about 120 million to run a motorway under the river for uh, that length and it's it was quite complex marine construction 
the gate, there's no getting around it. It is complex marine construction, but it can't be seen as any more complex than the Jack Lynch tunnel, uh, quite the opposite, if anything. So just to give people an idea of where we are with the 113 million, that's a good comparison to use. And again, getting back to our corrected uh, cost table of how that sends the costs tumbling and the contingency and the totals recalculated on that basis, we're broadly saying that it was suggested re realistic range with a high level of inbuilt conservatism of between 200 and 300 million for a fully functioning Little Island tidal barrier uh, that allows navigation at all times. So the, to summarize, uh, the key conclusions would be that the OPW have included a, a number of superfluous elements to inflate the, their most recent cost estimate of the tidal barriers. Um, there have been consistent methodologies employed by both HR Wallingford and Delft University, um, whereas the OPW may be double counts by taking a little from the HR Wallingford uh, approach and a little from the Delft approach. Um, there is a legitimate case um, for an increased length of sluice gates based on water velocity and navigation, but the OPW have taken this to an unnecessary extreme to increase costs. The variance of the OPW cost estimates with their previous cost estimates should be enough to um, raise concern uh, over the, the motivations behind the most recent cost. The sense checks on the cost elements would highlight that the OPW have certainly overestimated the cost and the inclusion of the OPW cost estimate in this analysis uh, has certainly resulted in a high degree of inbuilt conservatism, as I said. Now, there are follow-on questions. Has there been sufficient assessment of the Tivoli tidal barrier uh, to come full circle and uh, come back to the 100 million proposed or mentioned in the lease frames for that barrier? And the issue of storage behind the barrier was uh, was the reason for discounting it. But um, there are workarounds on that and there are differing opinions on the volume of water that would be released from the dam or that uh, could be stored in the dam to coincide with barrier closures. There's also uh, options like pumping uh, with high capacity, low head pumps over that barrier. Um, and what, what is the cost benefit of a tidal barrier in the 200 million to 300 million uh, cost range that we've, we've produced here? Um, with sea level rise, with Docklands development, with um, the demonstrated love of heritage and the keys uh, through this process, uh, does that tidal barrier become more cost beneficial? Uh, and certainly that has to be uh, compared with the competing solutions like the WALS proposal. So look, it's, uh, there's follow-on questions that will be the subject of further presentations.